my channel and thanks for supporting the course. I'm your host Wayne Chambers and today we're going to be talking about how to stay tall while maintaining a good running posture. How is this achieved? I asked the individuals in question to keep the hip height above the sea level. Sea level, you may ask? Imagine if you were that you're in the sea, you've gone to the beach and you're on holiday. The sea level is getting higher and higher the further you go out. So with that, I then asked my athletes if you wanted to raise the sea level from here, say around belly button height, to drop down to, I guess, around the level of where my shorts are, what would you do? Most respond by saying they'll probably raise the heels off the ground to get a little bit taller, which effectively is the answer. However, what some people have a tendency to do is be in the sea level um, and get stuck here. I want them to then raise their hip and maintain that. Easier said than done. The reason why I say easier said than done because most people have a tendency when they're running to land and if they are somewhat weak in the hips, they're gonna collapse. When that action is set over a period of two, three, four, five, six, seven steps, you're gonna get stuck there and that's gonna be a common disposition for you. Uncommon is staying up and maintaining that for a long length of time. So the ability to be able to keep your knees up, land and maintain a good hip height. That's why when I do ask my athletes to run, if they had to run in the sea, how would they keep their hips from sinking in the sand to then stay up? Effectively, this portion of your body between here and here has to be trained to maintain this position. A good approach when um, wanting to observe or give the athletes in question an idea of where their hip is positioned while stationary and both in motion is to get the athlete to perform some form of running exercise in adjacent to a bar or a barrier like this. And what you'll tend to find is if they are maintaining good posture when they run and land, you won't see much differential between where this bar is positioned on their hip, for example. So this bar is pretty much situated just, uh, just a little bit below my hip. So what you then find is when they're running, whether when putting this camera in slow motion, if there's a dip or if they're able to maintain. But for example, if I'm running, you see that I'm able to maintain this height. If I've got four hips, you'll see I'll dump or I'll start to sink. So this is just uh, another way for you to have a visual observation from not only yourself as a coach, but also for the athlete to be able to see as well. But what you want to avoid is saying, athlete, why are you dropping your hips? Why are you not keeping your hips up? So you as a coach have to be smart enough to observe that and think or put in place some form of drills that will teach the athlete or even give them a visual for them to be able to see the error in what they're doing. You as a coach need to be able to look at what core work or drills can be implemented into the athlete to enable them to hold themselves in a better posture. A drill that can be performed to help functionality of the hip and prevent any displacement or bending or bowing or giving whilst under stress of over distance running or sprinting is to encourage the athlete to channel their focus onto the frontal portion of their hip, the anterior portion of the hip. Not the posterior, not the back so much. If this portion of the hip is strong, not only to be able to hold the thigh up and maintain a good angle, but also when they land. It's also important to be quite firm in this area here, the front portion of the hip, especially around the top of the thigh, the proximal portion of the thigh, not the distal, the proximal. My reasons for this is when an athlete is running under pressure or under stress, you want the components to be trained enough and sufficiently enough to be able to cope under pressure. The drill that you can perform is getting the athlete to think about keeping the posture here. You think about it, when they hold their legs in this position, and even if they're not got the greatest hips, they still have, there's gonna still be an element of stability and control that needs, to be, that needs to be implemented. Even if an athlete's knees or thigh only comes to this angle, it's not ideal, but if that's where they're at, then it's a case of going back to the drawing board at the end of the season or implementing a few things during their season to help improve this. Not too much of a sudden change because if they don't feel that it's an imbalance or anything wrong, then anything sudden 
is going to cause them to have to adjust and that takes time and that can take anywhere from six to eight weeks depending on the ability of the athlete. Be firm in the front of the hip. One, to hold. Two, when you land. This base has to be firm and strong and able to cope. Otherwise, when the legs are up, if they're already fatigued and they land, they're going to buckle and sit. So at no point is there any support. The scaffolding between this area and this area is, is, is poor. So whenever they're doing drills, get them to focus on keeping a firm posture here on the standing leg. And when they land, again, applying it to the opposite leg. So instead of just being lazy and just doing walking drills like this or walking or sprint drills, instead of just lifting the leg and not challenging attention to this area, then this achieves nothing. We'll be doing any form of drills. If there's no application to this area that's under developed, then the drill is pointless. So whenever they're doing stuff like this, get them to focus on challenging the energy here and landing on the hip, that's gonna give them more back from what they gave in the first place. Moving on from the hip drills, everything that you do in regards to your body and how you apply forces to the ground, um, words like that can go over people's heads. I'd encourage you as a trainer or a coach to talk in a fashion that the individual or individuals that you're working with understand the point that you're trying to get across to them. Right, so I want you to look at this or come around to my way of thinking. Whatever you do in terms of running, whether it be marathons, sprints or long distance or middle distance, it's important to run in a way that's going to complement everything that you do. I like to encourage athletes to fold the knee whenever they're running. Some people are very lazy with the amount of tension that needs to be applied between the distal portion of the hamstring and the proximal portion of the calf. And what I mean by that, these two need to connect, even though they are connected by tendons and ligaments. The connection needs to be applied here a little bit more than you're accustomed to. A drill that I get athletes to do, just so they can understand the connection and the feeling and the tension that's required, I ask them, if I was to place my hands behind their knee, just between here, distal portion of the hamstring and just above the calf. I'll put my hands here and I'll ask them to bend their knee and squeeze my fingers. With that, that teaches them the tension that needs to be required in order to keep the knee tight. A tight knee angle is gonna encourage a better hip height. An athlete that does this very, 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 very well is Usain Bolt. Usain has the ability to keep his ankle up to his butt and over his knee better than anybody else. Yes, he has the advantage of hip height, but he also has the advantage that he's disciplined. Even when he's having a bad day, he remains in character. A good example, if you watch athletes like uh, Justin Gatlin, for example, under stress and under fatigue, um, you'll notice that, I believe it's his right leg, it, it's, it kicks forward. So although he has great ability to get out ahead of anybody else, even Bolt, and take him up to at least 80 or 90 meters. If his physical makeup enabled him to stay a little bit more disciplined with having his ankle over his knee, the results, I believe, would be a lot different in the 100 meters. But he had the ability, there's no doubt about that. So, if you have the ability to run, land, and start bending the knee from earlier, rather than waiting and come back here till this comes through and then trying to lift up. Lifting up two legs is gonna cause the body to lean backwards. So as you're running, you want to land and start making this action happen earlier. Keeping that, it's what's gonna enable this to stay in a better position. If we're running and kicking, we're gonna stomp, we're gonna kick and we're gonna start slowing down. So the key is to teach the athlete to understand the feeling of having fingers behind the knee and crushing them. This teaches them to keep good, good, good tension. This as a result would enable them to have their ankle over their knee, which is gonna land, enable them to stay above sea level, land firmly, have a firm hip at the front, and continue this momentum. So you can see what happens. As they land, you can see what happens. On the other hand, you can see what doesn't happen if you keep under. He's gonna be lazy, these are gonna get heavy, and then you're going to notice the is going to get lower and lower and start decelerating, which is what we want to avoid.